It's another fine day at Camp Dynasty. I am Counselor Austin, joined by Counselor Colin. And did anything did anything happen last weekend, Colin? I can't put my finger on what's I mean, going on. I went up to Door County at one point. Oh. Uh, you know, went up nice. to the peninsula. I, did, you, did you do anything this weekend? I did a little golfing this nice. weekend. Um, nice. How'd you shoot? Uh, n- not bad. Not okay. bad. Um, but... Did, did college football officially kick off this weekend? College football <laughs> officially kicked off this weekend. And what does that mean for us, Austin? I'll tell you what it means, man. Uh, we got a little sneak peek of this last week with week zero, but this is the real show right here. We are getting into what we like to call here at Camp Dynasty phase two, which is the college football season. And week one is in the books, almost. Uh, I actually think there is a game on as I'm speaking, Clemson and Duke, which is not a bad game. Um, And maybe there'll be some players we could have talked about on this episode, but we're going to be going through the games that happened from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and especially Sunday, man, because this was a full weekend, a full celebration of the beginning of college football. And we have a lot of badges to hand out again this week, Colin. Hell yeah, we do. I mean, getting to fully immerse yourself in the college football season after you know building up this anticipation with the scouting and all of the summer process, it all becomes real. And the, the guys put what you hope to see out on the field in a lot of the cases. I mean, we're at... We're going to talk about uh, 10 guys here. Yeah. We have five badges each to give out because, uh, number one, we don't have our all grown up segment, which will debut next week. Next week, baby. Where we'll be talking about our 2023 campers checking in on how they did week one of their NFL careers. But. Uh, That means we get to talk more about the guys in this fully loaded slate. And there are plenty of guys to talk about. Yeah, there are plenty. And like you mentioned, we're going to have 10 total that we're spotlighting today, but there were no shortage of options. And a lot of guys, a lot of the campers that we've already discussed through summer scouting showed up in big ways already in week one, which is always super exciting to see. Uh, So, Let's dive right in, man. Let's start. Let's start with the biggest story in college football in general, but it matters for us here at Camp Dynasty as well. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so we flipped a physical coin this time. We did. We did. Right. I, I I took the AI out of the equation. There were some right. questions last week. <laughs> so we're flipping, accusations. Yeah, accusations were flying, running rampant. I decided I'm done. We're going to flip an actual coin. And you prevailed. So maybe the AI was, uh, in fact, the issue. But Tails never fails. <laughs> I hate to say it. I mean, <laughs> you bring the real coin back. Get the AI bias out of this, and I get to talk about Shador Sanders. You sure do, man. And, I mean, the real deal badge is getting handed out to Shador Sanders because there were a lot of questions around this whole Colorado experiment as a whole with Deion Sanders coming over and bringing over some guys from that Jackson State team, uh, namely Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter Jr., And both of those guys show that they not only belong, but, I mean, they are built for this. Uh, Shadur Sanders, if you did not see, had 510 yards and four touchdowns on 47 attempts and 38 completions, good for 80%. And, I mean, man, it, it looks so easy. Like, the... There was a lot of the the dink and dunk. You know, we had that limited week zero slate last week, and I talked about Sam Hartman being Mr. Reliable and how he was, you know, just taking what the defense was giving him. Giving him. Uh, but Shador Sanders did that with his dink and dunks against 
a TCU team that was in the national championship last year. Different team, I know. You know that they they lost a lot of guys, and we've talked about a lot of those guys. But this is still a real program that's been good for a decent amount of time. You know, on and off. But you you look at Colorado going toe to toe with them and beating them, uh, and Shadur Sanders making this look so so easy. I mean, outside of the dink and dunk taken with the defense giving them, he had fantastic nine balls that he was throwing. I mean, throwing to Xavier Weaver over the top, number 10. He had Travis Hunter. I mean, again, that kid, we will talk about him. We'll get a little smuggle for Travis Hunter in here, even though he's not a camper. And then Jimmy Horn Jr. was also looking really good. So, I mean, whether it's Shador Sanders elevating them or them elevating him or they're all elevating each other, it's a lot of fun to see this panning out. So. Shador Sanders getting the real deal badge here off the top. Yeah, I mean, where where do you even start here? Because obviously, <laughs> like we're we're talking about Shador Sanders because this is a player, a quarterback that is eligible for the upcoming NFL draft, and we talked about that on our quarterback summer scouting, where he was he was the first name that came up when we did honorable mentions because he was the ultimate wild card. You you see what he did at Jackson state. And, you know, it it was very clear from the tape that he had legitimate arm talent, but you don't always know when you're watching a a guy, an athlete with that level of an arm playing against that level of competition, what it means in the grand scheme of things. And this was a major, major first step for Shadur Sanders to prove to everybody, most of all the NFL, that he belongs in that conversation to be a highly regarded quarterback prospect. Because, I mean, he led all of college football, all of college football this week in passing. 510 yards was the most of any quarterback in week one. I mean, he went toe-to-toe, like you said, with a team that is coming off of an incredible season. And, and yes, like you, like you pointed out, it's a, it's a different roster, but man, for this team, the team that was the meme team last yeah. year that so we I made fun of, we of, made fun of them yeah, more than once. And, uh, I don't remember the exact length of time, but it had been an obscene amount of time since this team opened the season on the road with a victory and that's exactly what they did. They they came in, they they took care of business, and a huge reason for it was this player right here, Shadur Sanders. So he is officially way on the radar here at Camp Dynasty. Yeah, absolutely. And Colorado is a sensation right now. Like they are the talk of college football, and that is mainly due to Shador Sanders. Uh, It's also due to the fact that they have already matched their win total from last year. Like you said, they were the meme team. They were one in 11 last year, but it also has to do with Travis Hunter Jr., who we will be marking our calendars for in in here real quick. We have to. I mean, (laughs) it was unbelievable to see a guy play both ways but also be one of the best players on the field on both sides of the ball and play full time on both sides of the ball. I mean, he played corner and receiver and he allowed like one catch. He also had over a hundred yards receiving. I mean, he had an interception. Like this is unreal. The the fact that we're just sitting here watching a, a player be like do things at this high of a level on both sides of football field for a full game. And then afterwards getting interviewed, he said, no, I can play another quarter. (laughs) Like I uh, I, I don't understand it. it, So for those keeping track at home, Travis Hunter will be draft eligible next year, 2025. So he's not in this class, but this was the number one, overall recruit do not forget that okay because you talk about a guy coming over from jackson state the talent 
was Georgia, Alabama. The talent was any program in the country. And he now finds himself at Colorado. Colorado has this premier talent, a, a, a player that shouldn't be there but is there uh, because of Deion Sanders. And you see even more than what you'd expect from a player of this caliber because he's doing the Shohei Otani, man. Yep. He's, he's I, doing the I Shohei. Didn't wanna, I didn't want to say it, but it's true. He is. And I mean, I have no idea. We, you know, we don't have to get too far ahead of it, but I think about next year, will he be a receiver? Will he be a cornerback? Right. You know, like, and for fantasy, obviously I'm, <laughs> I'm rooting for one direction there, but uh, yeah, I mean, what a, what a fun player. I, I don't know how long this magic can last with this team, but it's, it's amazing that we got this week out of it at least. Well, you look at, last year and this is the last thing i'll say is he didn't play much receiver last year at jackson state he he only had 17 catches and he had 11 in his first game (laughs) in colorado so uh you talk about a guy that mainly played corner last year and then Dion's like well let's see what he can do playing both ways the whole game and he comes out and has a performance like that i mean I I just couldn't couldn't move on even even though he's not quite a camper yet it, we're keeping our eye out. You have a talent like that at that program, you're playing both sides of the ball, buddy. <laughs> we need you on both sides of the yeah, ball. Yeah, seriously. All right. Well, that was a very exciting way to kick off college football uh, on Saturday, but my first badge is going to a player that we watched last night. Uh, meaning Sunday night for the game that we build as a must watch. Everybody dialed into this sport and beyond knew that LSU and Florida state was the game to watch this weekend. And man camp dynasty's own Florida state, by the way, just looked the part, man. We built them up through the entire summer talking about so many players from this roster on paper. It seemed like, yeah, this should be one of the best teams in the country. And they proved it on, uh, during that game against LSU. And a big reason for that is the player that I'm giving a badge to. And that's Keon Coleman. Uh, Keon is getting the, don't you forget about me badge. Because the only time this player's name came up on this program leading up to the season was as a a, a wide receiver that was noted for transferring. When, when we <laughs> talked about, I think it was Zachary Franklin, we said, oh, there's a few transfers out there. Keon Coleman, X, Y, Z. Well, Keon said, you guys better not forget about me anymore because... Uh, I gotta, I'll just say it right now, man, watching that game, watching what this player did on the field as a vertical X big wide receiver that showed me some catch point talent, you know, (laughs) I'm all (laughs) over it, man. Uh, this, this is easily a top five wide receiver in this draft class. I mean, I, it's not a player that I watched during the summer it it, it, that's plain and simple that's why he wasn't in my top five and honestly i think this season is even going to be more special than i think i was expecting because i you know you talk about where he comes from michigan state last season 798 yards good season i mean playing alongside you know Jaden reed i Transferring to Florida State, putting up 115 in the first game, uh, two touchdowns, looked like an absolute monster, looked like a player that could win against anybody in the country. That's what he looked like to me. He looked like a physical, dominant wide receiver, and I, I'm all in, man. I'm all in on Keon Coleman. I have 122 yards and three touchdowns. What, where are we seeing that? I'm on, I'm on PFF. 
I'm on PFF. So am I. Keon Coleman. Keon Coleman from Florida State University. Eight catches, 10 targets, 115, and two nine, touchdowns. Nine catches, 11 targets, and three touchdowns with 122 yards. Hold on. Oh, boy. I just refreshed my page, which yeah. I opened earlier today, oh. and the numbers changed. Here so we go. The PFF stats department, work on it, man. <laughs> we got to catch up on this stuff. How did how do you miss a whole target and a catch? Yeah, I see. I honestly thought he had three touchdowns, and I was like, well, I'm just yeah, going to go I, with the number here because I'm not going to look like an idiot. But now I do anyway. So thanks, PFF. Well, thanks, PFF. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Keon Coleman looked like the dominant receiver out of Florida state. I mean, we talked about Johnny Wilson in our top five conversation and he was completely overshadowed by Keon Coleman last night. I mean, the guy looked like a pure number one X receiver. And like you said, he jumps into the top five conversation just like that, like burst onto the scene. Here we are. And that that's due to the class partially because, you know, there's some uncertainty near the bottom of the top five of the, the wide receiver list. But I mean, it, it's, it's pretty simple that he looks apart. And uh, uh, like you said, I, I didn't, even think about watching him in the summer. Like he just wasn't on my list of guys. A lot of names, man. There's, there's, a, there's so a many lot of talented wide receivers. And I mean, if, if anybody who is a sicko like me and you, and if you're listening to this, I, I assume that you are at mock drafts, early NFL draft rankings for 2024. This is a name that you've seen already. Uh, yeah. This is not a hidden, this was not a week one, like, Oh, suddenly we got to pay attention to this guy. Uh, Dane Brugler, who I've said before is my most trusted NFL draft analyst. He's had Keon Coleman as a first round talent all summer. So this is a player that if you weren't familiar with him, if you, that's like that meme, like I was sorry, I was not familiar with your game. (laughs) Uh, now everybody is because everybody got to see what he did in that environment in a dominating win. Yeah, I, we watched this game for like nine guys, and he wasn't on the list. And then he jumps to the top of the talking board. I mean, man, this is this is going to be a lot of fun to go through this 2024 class. It's looking really nice. I mean, I, I want I want more 2024 picks. You know <laughs> what a big reason why it's looking really nice is. Is how about it, is your it next, of my, yeah, how my about next your player? next player? <laughs> well, all right. They're going to, you know, skip ahead if you're sick of hearing about him. But Caleb Williams, man. <laughs> I mean, he's getting the chosen one badge. Because uh, this is a ridiculous player. Uh, he was 18 for 24 for 319 yards and five touchdowns, no picks. It was a near flawless game and the, the plays that he made in this game there, there's two that are circulating around where the first one was the, the throw he made like running out of bounds to Dorian Singer, where he dropped it over his shoulder. I don't know how you make that throw. I mean, it's so ridiculous to, be rolling and all your momentum carrying you out of bounds and throwing it across your body on a rope and having it dive down, dropping right into your receiver spread basket. Stupid. That's a stupid thing to do. And the, the, the whole sideline was like, Oh my God, like that was not a throwaway. He didn't throw the ball away that that was on a dime to his wide receiver. Uh, the the placement in this entire game was unreal. Uh, he throws his receivers open regularly, which we talk about. But he's also like faster than you realize. Like when he gets going, it's oh, all right. So this is a real running threat. 
And when teams are playing man against him and corners and linebackers are turning their back to him, then he can just take off and get 20 yards. Like think about that in fantasy on top of getting, you know, 300 yards and four touchdowns, five touchdowns. And I mean, the, the touch pass that he had to Michael Jackson, the third, where he, you know, reads out, does the RPO and then just floats it, just kisses it over the entire defense and drops it in the he's going through progressions like he's a veteran in the league in the the drive that made it 35 to 7 you especially see it where he's like snapping you know one to two to three to four and then getting rid of it and then he had obviously the highlight of the day where he drops all the way back, steps up, rolls out. And he he goes through four or five progressions on that play too, where he's reading one to two to three to four to five back to one and then throwing to his wide receiver, Brendan Rice, in the end zone. So I, I just, I'm running out of things to say about Caleb Williams. That's what I got. He's getting the chosen one badge. The kid is unreal. I told you last week, man, we're going to be talking about this guy all <laughs> season long. And here yeah. we are again. Because, I mean... So I'm going to make a little bit of a, a bullshit comparison here, but I, I want to do it anyway for the content. Caleb Williams just looks above this level of competition. And obviously when you're playing San Jose State and Nevada, you should look that way. And the fact yeah. that he did is tells you all you need to know. He was making plays that are out of Madden. They're not. Yeah. football plays they're like how did you do that play mm-hmm. and i mean I, I just go over and and this is why it's a bullshit comparison because drake may is playing an sec opponent to kickstart his season with south carolina but you see how rocky things were at times for drake may in that game and he had some amazing throws amazing throws he Anybody, you know, you check the stat line, you see the two picks, you think, oh, what the hell's going on? No, no, he looked just fine in that game. It was a normal week one against a tougher competition sort of a situation where you're working a little bit of the kinks out, new wide receivers, all that. I, Caleb Williams walked into this season and saw these two matchups and said, how can I do the most ridiculous things possible? And then that's what he did for two weeks. And th- I mean, yep. you're talking about a guy, I think he's played like six quarters out of two games <laughs> and he has uh, 597 yards, nine touchdowns, no picks. So I think he is showing us and he's showing everybody that he is the player that everybody thought he was coming into this season he will be that level of talent. He will be the chosen one. And I mean, it. he, every week, man, I feel like we're going to have a reason to come back here and talk about this guy because the things he does on a football field are magical. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And who I, this NFL season might get a little ugly. I, I think as... We, you know, as more scouting departments are honing in, I think you're going to see teams that have those first round picks uh, and they're going to start tanking and they're going to start resting guys or trading guys. I mean, the Cardinals are actively tanking right now. Is that, yeah. Do you agree with me? Like, absolutely. This is the most blatant tank attempt I've ever seen in the NFL. uh, Whatever the Cardinals are doing right now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. they're not hiding it. <laughs> if, if Kyler Murray gets like shut down for the season or traded, it's going to be like, they're going to have to just investigate what's going on yeah. in Arizona. Like, and Jonathan Gannon, I mean, I don't even want to get started on yeah, what, what it looks like with him. We could do a whole like conspiracy <laughs> web here where it's like they only hired Gannon because they thought he sucked and they want to want and done him. And they <laughs> trade for Josh Dobbs because he has familiarity with the system. But so then they cover their bases like, well, he knows the system. That's why we traded for him. But they really just wanted to start Josh Dobbs for an entire season. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Clayton but tune. 
we're, yeah. we're going. Oh, Clayton yeah, Clayton, Toon, now Clayton Toon might be starting. I mean, I don't, I don't know. So man. we're looking at them. We're looking at, you know, the Rams could be going into this range. They have their own first for the first time in I don't know how long, and they stink. Uh, and then, I mean, Arizona's got Houston's pick, too. So, yeah. anyway, uh, Caleb Williams is going to be highly sought after is, is what I'm saying. And we might see some pretty ugly football, uh, out of some bad teams towards the end of this season to try to secure this generational talent. There it is, man. He said it. He said it. (laughs) Um, all right. Well, do you remember last week when we talked about the roadmap to a perfect Saturday and we said, man, some of these games, you might as well just pick a name out of a hat, and that's the name of the college that they're playing. <laughs> well, the first example of that, or at least the most glaring example, is um, Oregon against Portland State. And I, we made fun of Portland State on the podcast last <laughs> week. Apologies to you know a great university. I'm sure you know great programs there, but. Uh, it, it was not their day playing the ducks and (laughs) (laughs) um, this offense. Yeah. This offense, man, it was, it was cooking. It was cooking. Did you get a, like a PR email from Portland state? (laughs) What's going on here? I'm just trying to respect, you know, they, they went out there, they competed. I don't want to, well, yeah, that's questionable to say. Um, yeah, I, it was a bloodbath. It was an absolute bloodbath. And but this is what we're saying, you know, like these games, you gotta look like this. Like there were games to start this season where great teams were playing not great opponents and they didn't look the part. This was not one of those games. And uh, everybody on the Oregon offense looked great. Even Bo Nix was slinging it and. Uh, The player I'm giving a badge to here is my guy, Troy Franklin, because Keon Coleman might have knocked him out of the top five rankings in this class for me already. Uh, But I'm going to give Troy Franklin the yakety yak badge this week because, (laughs) yeah, you like that. (laughs) So one of my criticisms or, you know, one of the weaknesses that I identified with Troy Franklin over the summer was that he's not a big yak guy. This is a tall, lanky catch point X receiver. You don't see him getting into the open field and doing a lot often. Well, this game against that level of talent, (laughs) he at least showed us why he was a highly (laughs) ranked recruit and and an athlete because He got out into the open field a little bit in this game. He had 48 yards after the catch. Both of his touchdowns uh, came on plays where he had the ball in his hands and had to make a play to get into the end zone. Um, All in all, it was 106 yards. It was two touchdowns. He played the first half and I think a series in the third quarter, and and then it was over. So, uh, really, really strong start for for Troy Franklin and this entire Oregon offense. But uh, I was really encouraged by by a dominating performance from this player against Portland State. Yeah, yeah, this Oregon team thoroughly dominated and quelled the the crowd. That I, I'm going to go on another tangent here because oh I'm, I'm upset about the people that are like, oh. There's less snaps, so scores are lower, so college football is boring. Oh, God, yeah. This game was 81-7. to seven. There was a game that was 73-7, to 66-14, 66-13, 65-0, 59-14, 58-21, 50, another 58-21, 56-19. We had a 42-45. to 45. I mean, like, if your teams can't score, you probably stink. I'm sorry. Cause were these, you bored this weekend watching? I, I wasn't, I, I had fun. You know, what's good. NFL football, college football can be similar to NFL football. That's fine. You, you know what else is good when games don't take 40 years to finish? That's, yeah. that's you, what I like. 
I agree. And so it bothers me. Like Chip Kelly was talking, and I know it's Chip Kelly, and he's like, oh, we only had four possessions. Hey, get the ball back. Try it. Try to play defense. How about that? But anyway, Troy Franklin, fun player. I have another Oregon player to give a badge to later. Uh, and I'll do that as a little tease. But I like that. This is going to be a fun team with some playmakers on it. And Bo Nix seems to be capable enough to spread the ball around. I mean, again, I'll say it again. I don't think Bo Nix is a top five quarterback in this class. Like some analysts do some very credible analysts. Uh, But as long as he can get our guy, Troy Franklin, the ball, I mean, I'm starting to become a little bit of a believer because of what you're talking about. I mean, I, I, I didn't like love him when I first watched him, but like if he's going to have a little bit of this yak game, I'm going to have a little bit of more faith in, in him. So, uh, Troy Franklin and this Oregon team going to be, uh, you know, tune in and see, see how they're doing. I mean, if they're going to be putting up 81 points, uh, you know, against, Portland State. We'll see what they do against real teams, but it, it's probably just going to be a little bit of a diluted version of this, which is still pretty good. Still pretty good, man. <laughs> and we'll talk about your player a little bit later, but before we get there with the Oregon offense, let's stay on the topic of wide receivers because we've already talked about two very talented players, guys that I expect and you expect that they will be top wide receivers in this class when it's all said and done. This next player, I don't know what he's going to be when it's all said and done, but wow, what an impression. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Talk about yak guys. I mean, Trey Harris is getting the untouchable badge. Uh, This is an old miss receiver. He's number nine, uh, six, two, two Oh five. And he simply went out against Mercer and had six catches, four of them being touchdowns, nine targets, and a buck 33, good for 22 yards per reception. And that is due to him breaking uh, just about every tackle. I mean, they're obviously on two of his catches, he got tackled. On the other four, no. He, he, He broke at least three tackles on two of his touchdown. He outran everybody on one of his touchdowns and he carried a person into the end zone on his other touchdown. So like this is a big play guy that can take the top off. Uh, but it's also somebody that can get the ball in his hands and make people miss and break tackles and break angles. And I mean, yes, it's against Mercer. Um, but I mean, it's a guy coming in from Louisiana Tech. He transferred into Ole Miss this season. He had 925 yards and 10 touchdowns on Louisiana Tech last year. So coming into a more potent pass game, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what exactly he's going to be, if he's going to be next in this line of succession of Ole Miss receivers, because where do they keep finding these guys I don't understand where they keep finding these guys that just can't be tackled after they catch the ball. Uh, But I mean, here we are with Trey Harris and it'll be a fun season. If he also inserts his name into the hat of uh, wide receivers to keep an eye on. Yeah. I mean, I, so a little bit of background. I mean, you, you said there Louisiana Tech transfers in. We talked about Zakari Franklin being the the main transfer wide receiver for this team. Uh, and Trey Harris, not far behind there, um, highly touted in the portal, but not highly touted when he was coming out of high school. This was only a two-star recruit that landed at uh, Louisiana Tech. Did you give me fingers or my two? Two Just saying only yeah. two. Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> only two, man. And yeah. that's I mean, that's crazy because you just you never know with these players. And Trey Harris proved during his three year career at Louisiana Tech that he was much more than a two star recruit, that he was much more than a player that should be playing at that level of college football. And he worked his way to the SEC on this team 
And I mean, what an unbelievable way to start a season. I, 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 yeah, it's Mercer, whatever, dude, like this player had four touchdowns in this game. And I mean, that's, that's that think about what happened with like Jalen Hyatt last year. You see the game that he has that one moment in time that people remember. And obviously we're not going to, you know, remember this in the annals of college football with (laughs) Ole Miss beating the doors off Mercer. But I think it could be the start of a story for Trey Harris and a player that, you know, it's, it's kind of been the ultimate underdog story for him. Can he take it one step further and become a high, highly touted prospect in this class? Because he's got the size, he's got the speed. I mean, I can't say Mercer was tackling all that great, but he was making them pay for making some poor tackle <laughs> attempts. I'll tell you that. So uh, everything looks great so far. Let's see what he can do when they get into the meat of the schedule. Just uh, putting it out there. 73 to 7? You know, they, yeah. they found a way to score. There's another somehow. one right there. Yeah. Somehow they figured out how to score in this, you know, new college football format that, uh, you know, you only get one possession a game. How do you score any points? Uh, throw it to Trey Harris. That's how you score points. Hell yeah. And Zachary Franklin, by the way, was not playing in this game. He is he was not cleared to play, He's still dealing with a knee injury. So that left all of the opportunity here for Trey Harris. That might be all she wrote. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> all right. Well, so last year when we did our badges, we singled out one badge per counselor that would go to an IDP prospect. And this year, we're we're not doing that because I don't want to force badges to IDPs. I want them to earn it, just like the offensive guys have to earn it. And when they do, we'll give them the respect and we'll throw a badge their way. And I'm doing just that right now with the first IDP badge of the year. How about... Oh, God. Layat... Nope. I I literally watched a video to do this. Layatu Latu? Layatu. Layatu. There it is. Layatu Latu. This, I mean, (laughs) UCLA against Coastal Carolina. I'm watching the game. I'm watching my guy Carson (laughs) Steele with his UCLA debut. He didn't look too bad himself. But on the other side of the ball... Leatu Latu was absolutely unblockable. And that's why he's getting the unblockable badge for me this week. So again, fun little background for this player. And by fun, I mean, not fun at all. Uh, He started his career at Washington. We might've even talked about him last year because there was a lot of buzz that he might declare for the draft last year. This player had a great season last year. He transferred in, though, from Washington, and there was all sorts of medical question marks with him. He had a neck injury that it seemed as though might have ended his football career. And the doctors at UCLA cleared him to play. So he transfers there because he got clearance from this team to play football again. And last year was his first season there. He looked incredible. And he starts his second campaign with UCLA with 10 total pressures and three sacks, according to PFF's stat keeping, which is not always what it is (laughs) in other places. But three sacks, I mean, he was a dominant force. And the Coastal Carolina tackles had no chance against him. And that's exactly what you want to see. And it's not like Coastal Carolina is is a Mercer or, you know, a Portland State. But, <laughs> you know, th- that being said, the fact that he made these players look just completely incompetent and inferior tells you a little bit about the future that is in store for Leatu Latu. If these medical red flags that exist uh, still with this player in terms of his NFL projection – if, if all of that checks out in, you know, eight months time when we get to the draft, 
I think this is going to be one of the better edge players in the class. He just looks like he's on fast forward compared to the tackles. I mean, they they are (laughs) stuck in the mud against him. And I mean, a player that we haven't talked about, like you said, this year yet, because, you know, we had the one IDP episode and they have to, you know, earn the badges, no participation trophies. Three categories of players. I can't, you know, it's hard to hit them all. No, it, it seriously is. And, uh, I mean, if he's going to play like this all year and it, it wasn't a very, it wasn't a varied pass rush attack from Latu in this game. I mean, no, it wasn't. it's, I'm getting around you with my speed and he did it. I mean, three times and it's working. So no need to go to a counter move, no need to do anything else. Uh, but it, it'll be pretty sick to see uh, another, you know, edge prospect that that could emerge in this group. Yeah, I mean, he, he I think two of the sacks were off the rip. And the third one was just this left tackle didn't wake up and I yeah. and he just exploded off the edge and it, he didn't need a move. He was he was free at that point. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, the exciting. And then play. the then the tackle goes and like complains to the ref like mid play. Yeah. <laughs> he's like he's like, oh, that guy he had to be offside. Offside. <laughs> offside. There's right? no way he got there that fast. <laughs> yeah, uh, twelve sacks last year, three already this year. So yep. nice start. All right. We we're doing something a little bit unprecedented with this next badge, or is it badges, Colin? Uh, so I wanted to keep it within the framework of the show. Okay. Uh, so we're going with one badge. Okay. But two players. <laughs> so why am I doing this? Because I asked nicely, and we got Braylon Allen and Ches Malusi as a tandem the dynamic duo badge uh so the wisconsin running backs combined for 198 yards rushing and four touchdowns on the ground on 30 attempts just uh, crazy crazy and this was a one-two punch kind of thing where you know, Braylon Allen was kind of doing some of the dirty work like you might see him do. And then Chez was getting out there and taking the top off the defense, kind of, if you can do that from the backfield. Uh, if you can, Chez Malusi does. And this is a guy that we have not talked about before. So th- that's why I wanted to get him into the show. It would have been pretty easy to talk about Braylon Allen, which I'll do in a minute. But uh, Chez Malusi, he is a fifth-year graduate student. Uh, had two years at Clemson in 2019-2020, and he is in his third year with UW. Uh, so what? where did he come from? What is going on? Uh, well, he's just going to be Braylon Allen's running mate in this offense, and Wisconsin just seems to produce running backs and offensive linemen and linebackers, and so... Uh, I mean, he just has some juice and the lane, the running lanes looked really good in this game. It it didn't hurt to have that beefy Wisconsin O line in front of him. Uh, This was the debut of the Luke fickle offense. So it was nice to see that they stayed dedicated to the running game, you know, giving these two guys a hefty amount. And it seemed like there was a lot more running room than there has been as of late with, uh, Braylon Allen in this offense. Uh, but speaking of Braylon Allen, what did I like the most about this game? Seven receptions on seven targets, uh, only 25 yards, but I mean, seeing that he's catching seven balls is pretty sick. I mean, he caught 13 balls in total last year eight in 2021. So seeing that he's, you know, on pace to clear that and then some 
is awesome. And then on top of that, uh, getting 8.3 yards per carry, um, just completely decimating anybody that gets in front of him. I, I mean, he looked just as good as he has in the past, and he might have a little more juice like he talked about in the offseason. Yeah, I mean, I I appreciate we're getting Chez Malusi into the program here. And, hey, this was a four-star recruit, I believe, and he's had some hurdles on his way to this fifth year. But, I mean, the 89-yard run obviously was a huge part of his day, and he kind of s- sold the show starting the game. By the end of things, though, Braylon Allen reminds everybody why he is one of the top running backs in this class. And – I I'm with you, man. The number that stood out the most to me was that seven receptions. I mean, if we can, if we can get this all season, if this is going to be a big part of this offense is getting him the ball in open spaces in the passing game. I mean, that's only going to help his projection to the NFL. And I mean, a player that has had back to back 1200 yard seasons starting exactly how you'd expect them to in this yep. game so it's going to be another year of this and maybe even more i i really just want to make him my rb1 but <laughs> we'll we'll wait till we uh i, I gotta i i can't even say this though because i already did it with keon coleman i was gonna say we need to implement a three-week <laughs> limit where we can't shift but i'm like that's yeah, over we so. both already put it's Keon the coleman wild wild our- west here as uh <laughs> as it's camp starts for another year i mean it is the week of overreaction <laughs> after all so we we saw keon coleman have like one touchdown catch we were both like top five <laughs> yeah it, it went like first touchdown he's top five second touchdown wide receiver three third touchdown wide receiver oh. two i don't know <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let's talk about a familiar name to Camp Dynasty, but not one that you've heard about this year yet. I'm going to hand out the I'm back badge to Benjamin Urosic. It might be Urosic. I haven't confirmed this yet. The name police might be coming for me, but I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm going to, I'm going to go with Eurosic until I'm proven otherwise. It sounds better. Uh, so a little blast from the past here. If you weren't with us last year, specifically when we talked about tight ends heading into the 2022 college football season, uh, Eurosic was a top three pre-season tight end for me in the draft class that has now come and gone. And the reason why he's still in school and was not a part of that class was because last season did not go very well for Benjamin Urosic. He only had uh, 444 yards last year. That was a regression from his sophomore season in which he had 655 yards. So You expected big things out of him last year. The Stanford team was a mess last year. That that was the case, but he took a big step back. And it leaves you wondering, you know, is this player who I thought he was? Can he get to that level? Well, I think Benjamin Urosic took last season personally because he starts his 2023 campaign with Stanford against Hawaii and puts up 138 yards on nine catches, 11 targets, plus a touchdown. I mean, Eurosic looked like the dominant tight end that I expected him to look like last season. You talk about tight ends in this Stanford sort of mold, these guys that have come through this system, come through this program, uh, and he seemed to fit the the criteria to be the next in line. And we saw exactly why this week. I mean, he, he took over this game. He took over this game. This was the eighth leading uh, yardage total with, in, in terms of all pass catchers for week one. So you talk about wide receivers. This was the number one receiving tight end and one of the most productive receivers in all of college football this week. 
it's very exciting to see him put this kind of performance up to start the year. And I'm excited to get back on the train. <laughs> yeah. He's you, you texted me the name when we were, we were talking, you know, doing our little pre pod and you're like, Hey, Benjamin, you're all sick. I'm like, yo, he's back. He's back. We are here. <laughs> uh, the, the number I like the most with you, Rosick is 55% of his snaps came out of the slot which is awesome because it's not too much. You know, uh, the the problem with some guys is you're playing, once you get over that 60, 65% number, it's like, okay, you're kind of just a slot receiver. Now he's still playing 45-ish percent in line. You're still a real tight end. You're not just a slot receiver. Uh, and we, you know, or let's just stick with the overreaction, you know, week one overreactions. We're looking for a tight end too. In this class, <laughs> we are. I mean, there's a lot of names out there. We we were, I mean, completely different on our lists. Uh, if Eurosic wants, he can take it because the performances like this are going to do it. I mean, obviously, number one is not up for grabs, uh, but number two is is right there for the taking. And uh, Eurosic has the tools physically to do it. And a game like this is. You know, it, it looks great. And obviously every week's not going to look like this because, you know, tight ends, their performances are iffy. But, I mean, if it's anything like this, even uh, 80% of this, 70% of this, I'll be feeling great about putting him in the, our top five because, I mean, as a receiving threat and then also being a guy that can be in line and get dirty is something that I I sorely need out of this tight end class. So, I'm looking forward to a little more Eurosic throughout this season. I mean, it makes you wonder what happened last year. You know, what was the, what really was the cause? And I mean, obviously this is one week. I, I hope that he can continue this level of play, but I mean, you're talking about a, over a quarter of his season worth of receiving yards already accomplished here for in 2023. And I mean, he, he looks the part, when you talk about these move tight ends, these guys that flex into the slot, he he is that exact build. He's the 6'4", 242 with great catch point skills, man. I mean, you get this guy running up the seam and he will just win that ball so often. I mean, two catches on two, two contested catches on two contested targets in this game. That has always been a strength of his. And he had some amazing catches in this game, amazing catches, including his touchdown catch, which was a highlight reel grab. So it was all good things for Eurosic in this game. And like you said, there are there are spots to claim in that top five this year for the tight end. So. Well, we teased it and now we're bringing it home, baby. We're back to the Oregon Ducks against the fearsome Portland State. (laughs) A uh, little bit of a different story with this player, though, Colin. Yeah, so we're going with Oregon's running back, Bucky Irving, who uh, you talked about in the preseason. And, uh, you know, him and Troy Franklin, you were, you know, gassing up a little bit. And I'm like, all right, you know, these little guys from Oregon, they run fast. That's awesome. Whatever. And then Bucky Irving just goes out there and, you know, scampers on five attempts for 137 yards and two touchdowns. He's getting the glass cannon badge. Uh, Cause you know, you use it once uh, it does a lot of damage, but you know what, what's going on after that. Uh, but I mean, if this is how you're going to be used, you might as well get 27 yards per attempt. You know, if you're going to be an explosive player, You might as well do your damage when you're on the field and then hope you can see a little bit of an uptick because, I mean, he's got a history of carrying the ball a lot. You know, it's not like he can't handle a bigger workload. It's just that he didn't get it in this game, but in the five attempts he's got, he did a whole game's worth of uh, stat collection. So, I mean, just an explosive running back. That's all he needed, man. Yeah. They had 
guys cycling through there. I mean, they were keeping bodies fresh against this team, and obviously the score was running up very, very quickly. They opted to just let Bucky Irving cook. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it, it literally two of the runs, I mean, you're talking about breakaway touchdown runs from Irving. Uh, the one was obviously just a complete, you know, the – Complete breakdown on Portland yeah. State, and it was like there. I I I couldn't even believe how open that side <laughs> of the field was for him. But the first one, he did make a little bit of a play there. Yeah. I mean, again, we're talking about these programs the tackling very questionable here. But I mean, <laughs> Bucky Irving was kind of weaving and and making some guys miss through some traffic on the first touchdown. So I mean, he's an exciting player, man, and he he looks small. <laughs> I, I I watched the tape obviously in the summer. I liked what I saw, but you come away saying, "Man, he he looks smaller than the 5'10", 195 that he's listed at." And then I yeah. saw him in this game against Portland State <laughs> athletes, and I was like, "Oh damn, <laughs> he's pretty he's small. pretty small, man." But I don't know. He, he's just a fun player that I'm excited to watch, and I don't know what it's going to look like in terms of the NFL, but. He Deuce Vaughn's doing it right, so that's Bucky right. Irving a, can do it too. Uh, 70 yards after contact, which I think almost all came on that one play that you're referencing where he's kind of bobbing and weaving. Uh, but he also had a 92 percent breakaway percentage, which is uh, runs longer than 15 yards. Uh, so I mean, that seals the case. I, th- this is just going to be an exciting team to watch because anything could turn into a big play at any time. We have one final badge for week one and I'm not handing out one IDP badge this week. I'm handing out two. There it is. I IDP their people, man. That's and right. We're going to represent them so, on this apparently. program. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you know, Bucky Irving gets four carries. Uh, <laughs> slap a badge on him. Five carries. Yeah, yeah five carries. <laughs> My la- the last badge of week one, second IDP badge. It is the give me that badge for Tyler Newbin, safety for Minnesota. This is actually a player that we did talk about in the summer with IDP because we didn't have any DBs in our top fives, obviously, but this was the one that excited me going into the season as a player that could become a, an actual, you know, dynasty relevant DB prospect in this class. And, uh, we also talked about cam kitchens as well from Miami. Those were the two names and Newbin, I mean, amazing start to the season for him. He had two picks in this game, which is why he is getting the gimme that badge because he wanted the ball specifically that last, the second pick. I mean, we can talk about that. Nebraska pulling a Nebraska, you know, but ultimately it was Newbin there that sealed that game with the interception. And I mean, he, this is a free safety Last year, he has a an 83.4 run defense grade. This is a player that gets up into the box, but he was playing mostly at free safety in this game, and he was playing the position excellently. So you're talking about a bit of a two-way safety here, a guy who can get up, defend the run, can also hang back, has good instincts and coverage, can get takeaways. This is a potentially, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, this is a great DB prospect or anything, but I think Newbin shows you the sorts of things that you're looking for, for, for dynasty purposes. And, uh, we might actually get at least one DB this year. That's, that's worth, uh, drafting. You know, I used to think that when free safeties would catch like an overthrown interception, that was like, ah, right place, right time, you know? But then you see a guy like Tyler Newbin, you you get to see it from like more than just the the broadcast angle. And it's like, oh, no, this is high level safety play. 
You know, like when you're watching it just as like a consumer of football, it's different right. than when you're trying to like break it down. You're like, oh, shit. No, he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. And, you know, he's going to come up and make that tackle, obviously, if it's a catch. But then he's right there for the pick. And that's what happened on the first pick. And then the second pick to, to seal the game, he goes and attacks that and jumps that route. I mean, completely vacates the deep zone that he's in because he's like, I got gotcha. you. Yep. I know exactly what's going on here. He's reading that quarterback's eyes and he just hones in, jumps that in breaking route. And there it's all she wrote. And I mean, this was a classic big 10 affair. <laughs> this is a yeah, 13 well. to 10. Uh, but I mean, Newman, no small part in making sure that it stays down in that 13 to 10 range, because I mean, that's, that's a good ball player roaming the back end of your defense. And, I mean, whether or not he's going to be dynasty relevant, that's just a good football player to be on the top of your defense. Yeah, this was not the game that if you're trying to break into the wonderful sport (laughs) of college football, that if you sat down to watch this one, that might have ended it for you. (laughs) Um, But good player, nonetheless. Tyler Newbin taking home a badge this week. That rounds out our 10 badges for the week. A special extra badge per counselor this week next week like you said colin we will be diving into our 2023 campers in the nfl it's an amazing feeling we have nfl football this weekend um so that'll be coming up next week but there is one order of business left for this week colin before we get to it Outside of Bijan, who are you most excited to watch on Sunday? Or, am, or Thursday or Monday. You right. know what I, mean. I think, to be quite honest with you, the player that I'm most excited to watch right now is Zay Flowers. Okay. Because I think Zay Flowers is in for a better season than most people are expecting or were projecting when he got drafted by the Ravens. This yeah. program was very high on Zay flowers. And I, yes. I don't think either of us were afraid of this landing spot. And I think he has looked the part all summer long and I'm very excited yeah. to see what he does in his first uh, NFL action. I'm, I'm excited to see as much as I don't love the Vikings. I mean, Jordan Addison, I can't wait to to see because the corpse of Adam Thielen was getting a lot of looks last year and all of those looks going to Addison being the electric playmaker. He is getting, getting single coverage is going to be pretty fun, but you're still riding that Addison roller coaster, man. You were well, the biggest I'll, fan in the world. So now I'm lower on him. So now I'm excited I'm to watch him, man. I'm back. You know, I love it. When you when you're watching these guys for a full year, you, I get you it. go through a lot of emotions. You do. You do. Well, let's talk about some players that made us feel emotions this week. Um, it is time for the unsavory moment of Camp Dynasty's weekly segment here. It is the call home. So Like I said last week, I'm going to reiterate this because we brought the call home back last week and the people were excited. I got to say that I saw some folks on the Twitter machine getting a little excited about the call home. Um, But call homes do not mean that the players are bad. And I can tell you of this. Yeah. I had to remind you of this today (laughs) when we decided who we were going to dial up today. Uh, This is like the Wisconsin running backs taking home two badges. There are two players that are getting calls home this week. How about two of the best players in this entire draft class, Colin? How about the best dynasty prospect in this class, Colin? Marvin Harrison Jr. and Emeka Egbuka are getting dual call homes, calls home this week. Uh, Yeah, we got the two phones, Kevin Gates style right now. (laughs) Um, So let me just clarify this and then I'll let you say your piece. 
these are not, this is not like what's going on with Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh my God. He had, you know, two catches for 18 yards or whatever it ended up being. Uh, he also got hurt. And Emeka Egbuka, who did play the whole game, also did not have a very satisfying stat line. We talk about all these players that started this season hot, put up big totals. Ohio State was playing Indiana. This is one of those games where it's a conference matchup, but you expect them to look great. You expect them to make some noise. It was not an exciting day for Ohio State. It was, in fact, a very it was a bit of a grind for them against this Indiana team. And I think there were multiple instances where even, you know, early in the game and Marvin Harrison was there trying to get him involved where it just wasn't quite synced up. And I think, I think when I think about this call home for these players, it's not a what's wrong here. It's more of a, let's just, you know, things didn't go well this week. Let's just have a little conversation kind of, reiterate that this is these are growing pains with a new quarterback and uh this is there there's more to see out of these players for sure this year yeah i so we like like you said we were talking and you brought up hey we got to talk about this you know this should be this should be the call home and i was like we can't we can't we can't do this it's only week one you know, <laughs> and just, you're like, just this isn't a bad I'm auditioning thing. We're to be home. Skip's new partner. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, relax. It, it's not <laughs> a bad thing. It doesn't mean the players are bad. And you're right. You had to talk me off the ledge a little bit. I was going to go crazy. I'm like, why are we not calling Kyle McCord's parents? You know, why are we talking <laughs> <Yeah>. to. <laughs> and I'm like, he's obviously the problem. Uh, but. I mean, Marvin, he did have the injury. He said he's fine, and he ended up playing more in the game, but obviously didn't produce anything. Same with Igbuka. He he didn't get hurt. He just didn't produce much. And McCord looked so-so. And so this passing game, in general, I'm calling McCord's parents. I'm going behind your back, and I'm (laughs) dialing. I'm uh, I'm looking through the the yellow pages trying to find uh, MCC. Uh, But... I mean, th- this whole passing game never really got clicking in general. And like you said, it's going to take some time to grow. And, you know, we're just giving them a call to check in. We're, we're like, hey, guys, you know, we're we're good, right? We don't have to worry about this. We don't want to worry about this. You know, we don't want to bench Kyle. We will if we have to. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to have to get that far. Uh, you know, Marvin, he did him and Emeka did pretty well, you know, with CJ Stroud last year. We would like to see that again. So we don't have to have that stress on our shoulders. But, uh, you know, it's fine right now. It's fine. But don't let it get not fine. Yeah. I, and uh, that's we can we can talk about the fact that really this is a Kyle McCord phone call and. Kyle McCord's not a player that I am thinking about for the 2024 NFL draft class, and especially not after this performance that he had. I mean, it. remember, it took C.J. Stroud a little bit to get into the swing of things in his first season as a starter there. But, um, yeah, it, this is like the parents that, you know, we have these two premier talents coming to camp. Like, they sent their babies to Camp Dynasty. <laughs> This is the point where we have to call them before we get like a lawyer at the door. Like, <laughs> why are they not getting the ball more? This is like a, hey, we know what happened this week. We're not going to let it happen again, right? Yeah. So that's that's what this call really is all about. But uh, mostly I just wanted to talk about Marvin Harrison Jr., even if it wasn't a great way to start the season. Yeah, and well. McCord, he had a bad pick, uh, but the ground game looked pretty good. You know, the Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams uh, duo was pretty nice. Uh, that's what kept them chugging in this game. So, and a your little guy. shout out. Don't forget about your guy, Cade Stover. My, of course. You know, my tight end, too. Your tight Cade end, Stover. two. 98 yeah. yards in this one. 
that's right. Uh, so, you know, making me look a little bit better, but uh, throw it to to the other two guys a little bit more. That'd be yeah. nice. <laughs> All right. So that's week one, baby. That's college football. We're here. We made it. We're back. We got a full slate of badges. We even got a very sad call home this week. We're going to keep it rolling, man. Is, is it ever a happy call home? Well, it's never anybody happy. ever. At least when we call like to hear it. when we're calling, uh, you know, Mario Williams last week, it was kind of like, eh, just, well, figure it your out, man. Hey, your team's really good. Yeah, Sorry. your team's pretty good. And, you know, just just maybe get a few more targets next time. No, the, now we're just attacking the top two wide receivers in this <laughs> class because they have a new and potentially questionable quarterback. But that's yeah. what we do here at Camp Dynasty. So that's right. All about the positivity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, we're going to keep it rolling, man. This is many, many weeks of fun here. We have, I, this was an amazing week of college football. Oh. Like, let's not get it twisted. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of great performances, a lot of good teams, our team, Florida state emerging as a real contender. I would say a real, like I, they're not my, like, I'm going to stick them in there at the four spot, like in my predictions, like. They are a legitimate contender for the college football playoff based off of this performance this week. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun yet to come with this season. And we'll be back next week with more badges. And then of course uh, the all grown up segment, the debut. I cannot wait. I can't wait. That's something we've been looking forward to for, I mean, since we talked about camp dynasty as a whole Yeah, is getting to get into the future and talk about, campers past and yep. so needed uh, to get one man. year down and we made it yeah. man so here we go uh kicks off next week but if you enjoyed the discussion this week week one if you enjoyed the week of college football leave us a review a like uh, a share potentially a subscribe whatever is available to you on your podcast listening uh, platform of choice and of course Join the conversation here at Camp Dynasty. We are in the middle of college football. We are in the midst of it all right now. NFL uh, football is right around the corner. We want to hear your takes on the college football class of campers as well as the guys that we know and love from last year as well. So hit us up on Twitter, uh, sorry, X at Camp underscore Dynasty. Very begrudgingly calling it X now. Um Find us on TikTok at camp.dynasty and check out the YouTube channel where video feeds of the pods go up every single week. That is just Camp Dynasty. Here we are, man. We're in the middle of it. Hey, if you uh, want to, if you're, you're finishing up your redraft leagues and you want to share those our way too, and you're like, hey, how'd I do? And you want me to be honest, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, your team sucks. <laughs> I, I really, I would love that. You know, I see. <laughs> People being like, anyway, let me not, let me not. It's the end of the podcast. People turned it off already. They don't want to hear it. <laughs> They're gone, man. They're long gone. <laughs> They're like 10 team league PPR. And I look yeah. at team. I'm like, what the fuck? Why did they say good job? What, what are we talking about? Oh man. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by camp dynasty this week. We'll see you next week.